in 17 formal challenges. Lodged against specific books were filed in the U.S. last year. So 517 attempts were made to remove books from public and school libraries so that no one could read them. A successful challenge is called a ban, and the ALA reports a 25% increase in that from last year to this year. I brought this event to Lincoln Land in a year that was full of fear. Our first handbook reading took place in the Stevens Room on September 25th, 2001, exactly two weeks after 9-11. But the right to freely read is grounded in one of our most fundamental rights as Americans, the First Amendment. I believe reading banned books is an act of patriotism because it's supporting our right to freely read. We, we stand in support of our most fundamental American civil liberty. In just a few moments from our wonderful volunteer readers, you'll hear stories behind other challenged and banned books, but best of all, you'll hear excerpts provocative, beautiful, insightful from a wide range of literature. It was originally banned by librarians for being too frightening for children. And this was because of the illustrations. They thought that the illustrations of the wild things were just too frightening and children couldn't handle it. Others banned it for psychoanalytical reasons. They believe that where the wild things are, well, where the, the wild things themselves, were Max's projection of his anger towards his mother. Um, and through the story, you see Max tame his anger by taming the wild things. So Max said, be still, and tamed them with a magic trick of staring into their yellow eyes without blinking once. And they were frightened and called him the most wild thing of all. Challenged in the Vernon Verona Sherrill New York School District in 1980 as a filthy, trashy novel challenged at the Warren, Indiana Township Schools in 1981 because the book does psychological damage to the positive integration process and represents institutionalized racism in the guise of good literature. But how can you tell, I asked. I told you, Scout, you just have to know who they are. Well, how do you know? We aren't Negroes. Uncle Jack Finch says, we really don't know. He says, as far as he can trace back the, finch, the finches, we ain't. And for all he knows, we might have come straight out of the Ethiopian during the Old Testament. Well, we came out during the Old Testament. It's too long ago to matter. That's what I thought, said Jim. But around here, once you have a drop of Negro blood, that makes you all black. Because the whole book is about um, book banning, and then it's been banned. So the book is about a futuristic world where people don't connect with each other, and they don't really even have independent thoughts. They're so involved in their TV and their games, um, and books now are let's out. take up the minorities in our civilization, shall we? The bigger the population, the more minorities. Don't step on the toes of dog lovers, the cat lovers, doctors, lawyers, merchants, chiefs, Mormons, Baptists, Unitarians, second generation Chinese, Swedes, Italians, Germans, Texans, Brooklynites, Irishmen, people from Oregon or Mexico. The people in this book, the people in this play, this TV serial, are not me meant to represent any actual painters, cartographers, mechanics, anywhere. The bigger your market, Montag, the less you handle controversy. Remember that. All the minor, minor minorities with their navels to be kept clean, authors full of evil thoughts, lock up your typewriters. They did. Magazines became a nice blend of vanilla tapioca. Books, so the damn snobbish critics said, were dishwater. No wonder books stopped selling, the critics said. But the public, knowing what it wanted, spinning happily, let the comic books survive, and the three-dimensional sex magazines, of course. In part, it's about one person's odyssey, maybe his ascent or descent, depending on how you look at it. And it's certainly infused with the issue of race. Uh, it was published, I think, in 1950. Sort of the challenges have to do with uh, racial slurs, sometimes sexual content. I am an invisible man. No, I'm not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids. I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus sideshows, it is though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorting lights. 
When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except. Monologues have been banned from many schools due to its graphic and brutal sexual encounters, as well as promoting homosexuality and even for the use of the word vagina. The piece that I will be reading today is a compilation of testimonies from Bosnian women that were subjected to rape camps. This piece is entitled, entitled My Vagina is My Village. My vagina was green, water soft in the fields, cow mooing, sun resting, sweet boyfriend touching, gently the soft pieces of blonde straw. There's something between my legs. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it is. I do not touch, not now, not anymore, not since. My vagina was chatty, can't wait, so much, so much saying words. Can't quit trying, can't quit saying, oh yes, oh yes. Not since I dreamed that there's a dead animal sewn in down there with its thick black fishing line and the bad smell cannot be removed and its throat is slit and it bleeds through all of my summer dresses. But today it is banned still in countless number of countries around the world. Obviously it played a huge role in communism developing and you know, turning into the Cold War in the US in the 50s and 60s because of McCarthyism. It was banned in public libraries all across the US. Yeah. Just stunned at how much of it, you know, we hear today. I mean, people don't call it communism by any means, but people are very angry with globalization and things like that. And so is Marx. In bourgeoisie society, living labor has been means to increase accumulated labor. In communist society, accumulated labor has been a means to widen, to enrich, to promote the existence of the laborer. In bourgeois society, therefore, the past dominates the present. In communist society, the present dominates the past. In bourgeois society, capital is independent and it has individuality, while the living person is dependent and has no individuality. Uh, it appalls me to think that something like this, something that has brought me so much joy and so much happiness and so much original thought, could be taken away from kids by, you know, restricting it from schools or not allowing their children to read it because we think that it's bad for them. If we don't allow them to have their own original ideas, then how are they ever supposed to be their own people? And through the merry flowers of June, over grass and over snow, and under mountains in the moon, roads go ever, ever on. Under cloud and under star, yet feet that wanderings have gone, turn at last to go home afar. Eyes that fire and sword have seen, and horror in halls of stone, look at last on meadows green, and trees and hills they long have known. Gandalf looked at him and said, My dear Bilbo, he said, something is the matter with you. You are not the hobbit that you once were. It's also a piece of nonfiction, and it was also a gift given to me by a very important person. And this book has helped shape who I've become the last couple of years since I've started going to school and learning more about the things that you learn outside of high school. And um, this book was actually banned last year and I'm sorry, it was challenged um, in a, let's see, North Stafford, Virginia High School advanced placement history class, even though it was not the preliminary textbook because it is, quote, un-American leftist propaganda. I see a lot with his labor unions were rising up and trying to uh, strike out against him, and so he was trying to not only help with the crisis going on, but he's also trying to quell the mobs that were showing up in Washington, D.C. at the time. That first objective was to stabilize the system for its own protection. It was the most obvious and major law of Roosevelt's first months in office. The National Recovery Act, it was designed to take control of the, ec of the economy through a series of codes agreed on by management, labor, and government, fixing prices and wages, <coughs> limiting competition. From the first, the NRA was dominated by big business and served their interest. So you can see that the things that caused our current recession, while not nearly as bad as the Great Depression, are similar. But the same problems are cropping up over and over again because, as Howard Zinn says, the system we have in is corrupt. And it's great. Thank you once again to all our readers and also. Thank you so much to Lincoln Land and to the Department of Arts and Humanities, to the library, to Phil back there, uh, to the Feminist Activist Coalition who are our sponsors for this event um, year after year.